Many of us in the room grew up during the years of the Cold War, a time when the threat of nuclear annihilation kept many on edge, especially those who had lived through the horrors of the Second World War. As a child, I recall regular drills at school where we would hide under our desks to protect us from a possible missile attack. But all of that was supposed to change when the Soviet Union collapsed in the winter of 1991. And for a brief time, it did. But once Vladimir Putin came to power and crushed any meaningful opposition, Russia ended its experiment with Western values of free speech and a market-driven economy and began to reinsert itself in global affairs. We are very fortunate to have as our speaker today John O'Loughlin, an internationally recognized expert on the former Soviet Union, as well as other post-communist societies. John has been a professor of political geography at CU for more than 30 years and has a very long list of academic publications. In fact, he just came back from one of his frequent trips to Russia and the Ukraine. John will focus his talk on the question, should we fear Russia? The timing of his talk is certainly topical as we read and hear about Russia's interference in elections, ours and others. Now, let us welcome Professor John O'Loughlin. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, Fred, Fred. I'm going to uh, basically make a counter argument to what you just said, um, and this is a contrarian talk um, because, first of all, um, give me the first slide, please. Um, I don't fear Russia. Um, in fact, the question should be: Should ye fear Russia? Or actually, better: Should ye fear Putin? because you can't fear a country, obviously. You can only fear a person or a regime. And I'm going to um, look at the world from the eyes of uh, Vladimir Putin and basically say that he believes in a, a NIMBY philosophy. He's a NIMBYist, uh, which is not in my backyard. It's not about really world affairs. It's not really about the US. It's really about Eastern Europe, the, the parts of the former Soviet Union on the edges of Russia, which Russians refer to as the near abroad. And that's, by, by the way, where my research is currently focused. Um, and I want to um, introduce uh, the topic by saying that actually, as Churchill said many years ago, Russia is a somewhat mysterious place, always has been for Western commentators. But Russians are like anybody else um, in the sense that they value economic security, um, they value family very strong in Russia, but they also um, have very and growing negative opinion about the US. It's changed dramatically since the early 2000s over the last 15 years. And it's not because, not only because of uh, Russian media, um, it's also because of some Western actions. So um, we can, uh, all right. So I'm going to give you a series of nine propositions very quickly. Um, and I'm going to, again, make the case that Putin is not as strong as he seems. Russia is certainly not as strong as you might think, and Putin knows that. And more importantly, that in only one regard is Russia anywhere equal to the West, the US and West, and that is, of course, in the nuclear arsenal. So if you look at the graph, you can see Russia and the US are pretty much the same number of uh, nuclear warheads everybody else trace uh, is far behind. But overall, Russia's military spending is only about 1 20th of, of the NATO countries. Um, Russia's dominance really is only in one area, and that's on um, Zapad, the Western Front of Russia, the Eastern Front of NATO, in countries like Poland and the Baltics and so on and so forth. So if there were a sudden attack, there Russia would have an overwhelming victory early on. But of course, uh, in the long term, that wouldn't work. Um, and also, of course, as Fred mentioned, the Soviet times, uh, Russia is much weaker in almost every respect. It's a pretty small economy. It's the 12th largest in the world. It's only about one-tenth as big as the US economy. It's a middle-income country. If you kind of look at 200 countries in the world, it's about 70th or so in terms of income. But it's an oil economy. And so for Russia, for Putin, 
uh, for its popularity, oil prices are absolutely critical. So oil prices of $100 or more per barrel would be very uh, welcome. Uh, prices of $60, $70 are, are not so good because, as you can see, 60% of its exports are from oil revenues and 30% of its GDP uh, is in oil. So the Arctic is critically important for Russia in terms of new oil fields, and that's why, of course, they're paying so much attention there. Um, the second proposition is that Putin himself um, at home runs what is often referred to as a bureaucratic authoritarian regime. Um, it's not as repressive, actually, as many other countries. Um, it relies on the support of uh, a, lot, a relatively small number of very, very rich people, the so-called oligarchs, uh, and those who support Putin and uh, he has made a bargain with them. They can operate, they can have access to state resources, they can have access to uh, state contracts, but they stay out of politics. Um, and if they don't, then they get kicked out of the country like Khodorkovsky or meet a kind of mysterious end like Beresovsky. Um, but in a sense, it's like the boyars of uh, late medieval Russia, where you have kind of the knights of the court plotting, scheming always, and the Tsar having to worry about their activities. So he has this bargain with them. It works so far, but it could easily be upset. Um, his approval is very important for him. And the, and the third proposition is that compared to the 1990s, which was a horrible decade in Russia, and I went there many, many times and saw the, the poverty, the, the increased pauperization, the complete collapse of a society um, under Yeltsin, who was a Western favorite. And Russians remember that very well, and so they turned to Putin to, to shape things up, and he did. Uh, he ended sort of the conflict in North Caucasus um, in the Chechen rebellion, and he uh, restored order. If you look on the graph on the right, um, the key thing to see here is how low on the bottom is democracy in terms of the priorities that Russians say their government should have. The top scores, and they haven't changed at all since 99 when Putin came to power, is stability, uh, paying pensions, kind of economic security. That's what Russians care about. And they don't really care very much about civil liberties and democracies and these other uh, things that are emphasized in the West. His popularity has always been well above 50%. It's now about 66%. It's down from the 82, 83% in the immediate aftermath of the Ukraine crisis. And he pays close attention to it. Just today, there was a story in the Moscow papers how um, only 35% uh, of Russians said they trusted Putin, and he contacted a polling firm and said, why is it only 35%? And there's a good reason for it. It was an open question. When you ask Russians directly, do you trust Putin or not, it's actually 75%. So he pays close attention to popularity, and his popularity is based on this stability and on this um, contrast with Yeltsin. Um, in terms of international relations, he's a realist. So he has banged on about this for a long time, that America is trying to institute a unipolar world, and he's against unipolarism, and he wants a multilateral world or a multipolar world. And to do that, of course, as a weak state as a weak power, Russia has to find allies, and increasingly the ally is China. So right now you could say there are kind of two cold wars going on, or at least starting. One, sort of the ones that Democrats like in the US, the Cold War against, uh, against Russia. The second Cold War, which maybe Republicans like more, is the Cold War against China. And so you kind of combine Russia and China, um, basically now um, in Cold Wars against the US in different spheres, he has an ally. And so increasingly, there are uh, economic arrangements with China. Um, there are uh, military exercises with China. There's a lot of cooperation in Central Asia. Um, but at the same time, Russians do still have their doubts about China, and especially uh, Chinese interest in uh, Siberia, in, in the Far East. But from a perspective, he looks at the world. He sees American bases, especially to the east and south. He is focused on, and I'll get to this in a second, uh, Eastern Europe. But beyond that, his interest is in sort of creating slight headaches for the US, so Venezuela and Cuba. And again, a major commitment to, us, to Assad, to the Shia coalition in the Middle East, uh, Iran, uh, the Assad regime, Hezbollah. And, but also will deal with a country like Turkey, which is a member of NATO, and relations between Russia and Turkey have gone up and down with respect to their activities in Syria. But he won the Syrian war for Assad. He kept Assad in power, uh, even though he doesn't really control Assad. 
but the rhetoric at home is always that Russia is a major global power. It has to be respected. Um, it's not respected. It certainly wasn't respected in the 1990s, and everything went badly wrong. So the idea since 1999 is to reverse the decline, the collapse, the chaotic uh, years of the 1990s. So he cares most for the neighborhood, right? Not in my backyard is his general geopolitical philosophy. And the key countries are Ukraine, Georgia, and to some extent, Kazakhstan. Um, and here, there is a very strong uh, Russian presence. Um, large Russian populations, large numbers of Russian speakers. In other words, half, of Ukrainian, half the population in Ukraine speak Russia, Russian as their first language, despite this new law in Ukraine, the language law that privileges Ukrainian, most people, in fact, use Russian on a daily basis. Similarly, in Kazakhstan, has a large Russian minority. Georgia, not so much, but there are pro-Russian groups uh, in Georgia. And so those are the places he focuses on. And in many ways, he's um, interested in this idea that Winston Churchill first um, brought up in 1939. You, we all know the quote about a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. But if you read the rest of that statement from Churchill, you'll see, in fact, he recognizes Russia's key interests in Eastern Europe. Um, and then, of course, that's formula formulated by uh, George Kennan, the father of American containment in 1946, this idea that Russia has a traditionally neurotic view of world affairs and is mostly concerned with encirclement and especially uh, hostile powers in its, on its western border, um, today's eastern Ukraine. So um, he also remembers, this is Proposition 6, he also remembers very well broken western promises. And those of you who remember back to the, the time that Fred referred to, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the unification of Germany, the end of the Cold War around 1990, there was a, a promise made by western leaders um, and you can see a list of them here, German foreign ministers, various British prime ministers, uh, American secretaries of state, um, that NATO would not expand one inch eastward, right? And the bargain was that Gorbachev would then allow members of the Warsaw Pact, like Poland and so on, to follow their own path. In Putin's view, and at the time, of course, he was a KGB officer in Dresden, in East Germany, he um, believes firmly that Ru uh, Russia was cheated out of this arrangement that they had made with the West. And so he believes, and the map clearly shows, that as NATO expanded to the east, all those uh, dark orange colors uh, in the east in, in former parts of the Soviet Union, the Baltic republics, but also members of the Warsaw Pact, like Hungary, Poland, Bulgaria, uh, Romania, and so on, he believes that this is part of a a general uh, attempt to kind of hem in Russia to make it, as Obama referred to at one time, a weak regional power, to keep it in that light, as opposed to kind of a global power that um, Russia has always aspired to uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, so we hear a lot about uh, hybrid warfare and about Russian interference in Western elections and about uh, the use of media, television, social media, all the rest of it. Um, but this may or may not come as a surprise to you, but in fact, um, Putin and Russia learned from the West how to do this. Uh, in the 1990s, Western pro-democracy uh, groups came flooding into Russia, like the National Democratic Institute, like a lot of NGOs sponsored and funded by um, the US to try and build a democratic society, to make it more Western, to kind of move it away from his traditional, almost orientalist um, ideals. And Putin saw these, when he came to power, as undermining his, his credibility, um, obviously his control, and his pushback strongly. So now there was a new law against so-called foreign agents, including, by the way, uh, polling firms. Um, he also began to say, what happened in countries like Ukraine um, like the Orange Revolution in 2004 and 5, and then later on in Kyrgyzstan, the Rose, the Rose Revolution in Georgia, uh, in Kyrgyzstan, the Tulip Revolution, in Belarus, the failed, it was called the Jeans Revolution because people wore jeans, um, and, and so on. But especially what happened in Russia in 2011, when Hillary Clinton, among others, promoted and encouraged anti-Putin uh, opposition movements, 
he saw that as a direct threat and said, if they're promoting democracy in our part of the world, we're going to counter. And since then, things have really ramped up in the last 10 years or so. Um, so you have kind of pro-democracy, counter-democracy. And again, ideology doesn't really matter here. Um, as long as it's kind of a, in the West, a you know, far right, far left, as long as it's against the center, against the current uh, governments, that's what uh, Russia supports. Um, obviously, um, this graph, if you look at the uh, highlighted area, the US is now very much viewed in Russia by Russians as the enemy. Ukraine wasn't on there at all until after 2014-15. Now it has um, about 30%. But the US has gone up significantly. And again, this is encouraged by Russian media, but it also reflects this um, competition. Eighth proposition is about the area, the neighborhood. And as I said, the two key countries are this, um, Georgia, you can see underlined at the bottom, and uh, Ukraine. And both of those regimes over the last 15 years, well, in the case of Ukraine since 2014, have asked to join NATO and the EU. And especially Merkel in Germany, but other EU leaders um, don't want it because, of course, they'll bring their headaches to NATO and to the EU. Um, both of them have major um, separatist movements, in the case of Georgia, two so-called de facto states. Uh, these are so-called places that don't exist, but they have governments they're recognized by a few countries, like Russia, um, as independent, but they're um, kind of a thorn in the side of the pro-Western governments in Georgia, and more especially in Ukraine. Ukraine is the key country here, by far the most important. Um, it's the kind of keystone in the arch, if you think of it that way. And the war, of course, continues in Donbass, the shaded area in green on the eastern side of Ukraine. And of course, Crimea, the Russian majority area, was annexed um, by Putin in 2014. But that's, these are the two countries he's most concerned about. And he wants to keep those regimes on, on edge, on the defensive, and would make enough commitment to keep them in that situation. So again, when the war in Donbass was going against the rebels, it looks like they're going to defeat it. Russian troops came in defeated the Ukrainians, forced them out of that area, and since then it's been a, a relatively stable situation. The same thing happened in Georgia in 2008, a quick invasion of Georgia in response to Georgian government trying to take back South Ossetia, and again, kind of this unstable um, situation. But beyond that, um, it's really a, a question of opportunity, but the real focus, the real commitment is to these um, two places. And then, of course, the last proposition is, who do you want in charge of Russia's nuclear arsenal? I mean, ask yourself that question. Um, Putin, despite all of his warts, um, is a, a force for stability in many ways. Um, and his term will end you know, in five years. Uh, this is the second of the second two um, terms as president. Um, and so what's going to happen then? He's, I don't know how old he is, he's in his 60s, mid-60s now. Will he do uh, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev? And this is the president of Kazakhstan who stepped aside earlier this year, but in fact is behind the curtains pulling the strings. Will Putin do that? Will he retire gracefully? Will he go for a third term? Who knows? But I will tell you that whoever uh, replaces him, or if he continues, the key point is to have a stable Russian government. The last thing the West wants to do is to encourage instability in Russia itself. Um, it's worked so far, the Putin argument about the West. Um, it was always the search for a bogeyman. It's the argument now increasingly that NATO and the West are not satisfied with just a defensive uh, arrangement in Eastern Europe, but they're trying to go further. They're trying to uh, kind of create instability in Russia itself. They're trying to bring former close Soviet countries, allies, into the uh, NATO. And therefore, it has to be opposed at all costs. But I'm convinced that the real question for Russia is that will, will NATO and Russia reach an accommodation? Um, or will they keep playing these games of chicken that you hear about constantly with NATO um, having a lot of military exercises in the Baltic countries uh, on the borders of Russia, Russia and NATO planes literally within feet of each other uh, at high speed, um, kind of playing games of chicken. This goes on all the time. It could go badly wrong. But I think the real um, 
focus, the real danger is in uh, Eastern Europe, especially in Ukraine. And so that's the place above all to keep your eyes on. So the bottom line for Putin is that he's like a lot of um, people living in neighborhoods who don't want something in their neighborhood. He, that's his view of Eastern Europe and that's his geopolitical strategy. And I'll end there and happy to take questions. So thank you very much. I see, a, I see a woman way over there, yeah. Hi. <laughs> yes. Yes. That are not part of anyone's backyard, except their own. Right. No, that's true. And I, I think I had a slide here that these, well, maybe not, um, that they have their own interests and their own wishes. And for, take Poland as a good example, right? Um, which obviously really wanted to join the EU, joined the EU and NATO in the mid 2000s. Um, and you're right. I mean, countries should have the ability to pursue their own interests and their own alliances. Um, but if you believe in great power politics, there is the idea that um, certain local interests are in fact often subject to bigger great power interests. And so Putin is not you know, terribly unhappy that Poland is, is part of NATO, but he's worried about how much further NATO is going to go. There's no line in the sand. Recently, the US uh, Under Secretary of uh, State for European Affairs said that the US has to keep pushing the front line of freedom forward. So if you're Putin and you hear that, you're wondering what's next? You know, is it what's after Ukraine? And um, the fact of the matter is that, you know, for him, the, the red line has been reached now and it can't be breached anymore. Um, I will also say, by the way, if you take that argument further, then places like Abkhazia and South Ossetia and Transnistria and Crimea and Donbass should be allowed to do what they want, and that is basically get independence or join Russia. So, you know, you can't have kind of promoting uh, independence and interests of one set of countries and then ignore it for another set. And Putin, in fact, has said in the past that Kosovo, which the West was um, promoting its independence strongly, Kosovo, uh, Putin said, uh, he could use it as a stick to beat the West, and he has by uh, supporting Kosovo-like governments in Georgia and uh, in Ukraine in these separatist areas. Yeah. Okay. Should I speak? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, thank you for the um, lecture. That was very interesting. I want a uh, question about three points that were not raised that go beyond the geopolitical boundaries. Mm -hmm. uh, one is climate change, mm -hmm. which could actually mobilize uh, global, you know, coming together rather than a hot war, because people have to pull together to actually tackle something that's beyond their borders. Mm -hmm. So climate change is one. The second one is the, um, the orthodox religion in uh, Russia, which I understand 70%, mm -hmm. you're shaking your head, yes. 70% yes. of the country believes in that, which also leads you toward the third point, which is about their preference for a strong leader. Mm -hmm. So those three things, climate yeah. change mobilizing, uh, but counter to that is their um, orthodox religion, which unifies them around a strong figure, and, and in the case of Putin, a, a strong male leader. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. But climate change being, and then because it's my field, uh, looking at the concept of putting leadership into balance, where in the West and democracies, if we begin to bring more women into leadership, mm -hmm. it's going to change the cognitive um, diversity and thinking of strategies around the world. Mm -hmm. Angle Merkel is one example of that. Yeah. Um, I'll just respond quickly. Um, on climate change, the key place is the Arctic. Um, most of you know that Arctic sea ice is melting quickly, and the sea lanes are now open during the summer, uh, Ar the sea ice uh, lanes. And Russia has really um, made strong and kind of <laughs> very prominent Arctic claims. For example, they in 2007, the Russian Geographical Society planted the Russian flag under, directly under the uh, North Pole, under the sea ice, in a, in a, in a sub, using a submarine. Um, and so for Putin, uh, the sea, um, the Arctic uh, Ocean, uh, 
is not only a transit area, but it's also an area of vast, possibly vast, oil and gas resources. So they have a major, major interest in that. Um, the other two points, by the way, the Orthodox Church thing is, is fascinating. I may or may not know, but the Ukrainian Orthodox Church has split off from the Moscow Patriarchy. Um, um, in the way the Orthodox Church works generally is that they're typically aligned uh, as state churches. And what Putin has done is um, he has really um, taken over or made a partnership with the uh, Moscow um, Patriarch to promote orthodoxy almost as a Russian state religion. Um, there is a ban effectively on religions, um, non-traditional religions recruiting in Russia. So only the four traditional religions have full access in Russia. That is orthodoxy, Islam, Buddhism, and Judaism. Right? But so Protestantism, Catholicism, those kinds of things are considered non-traditional religions and there are lots of restrictions against their operations, especially against groups like um, Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and so on. Um, the third point, by the way, about the strong man, um, yes, <laughs> there is a lot of that in Russian history. And uh, of course, that's how Putin uh, portrays himself. You've seen those pictures of him riding horse bareback, uh, sorry, not bareback, but bare-chested and you know, flying planes and helicopters and diving to the bottom of the Black Sea and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, so he, pro he certainly promotes that image. Oi. And secondly, how fragile is our working relationship with respect to the space station? Um, that's a good question. I, the second one I don't really know um, the answer to, so I can't really answer that. Sorry, um, the two questions were how would John Bolton react? And the second one was about the nature of the American Russian uh, cooperation on the space station. Um, I said I can't answer the second one because I don't know anything about it. Um, the first one, um, he actually might not disagree terribly. I mean, he, he is, in his view, I think, Bolton, a realist. Um, the, the thing about American geopolitics um, is that it's a very unusual and almost unseemly combination of ideology, which is promoting democracy and freedom and all that good stuff, and hardcore geopolitics, right? And Americans like to believe and, and really promote the first one, but they really typically ignore or don't pay too much attention to the second one. But America is as much, in many respects, as a, a realist power in world affairs as Russia. And I think on that sense, Bolton might say, well, maybe we can make an arrangement here. So too bad about the polls if they get caught in the vice, but that's just the way of great power politics. So actually, he may not be um, as oppositional as, as one might think. There's been a number of movies lately from Russia, like Leviathan and also... Sorry, I, I don't know where the question is. Oh. Okay. There's been some Sorry. movies... Okay. There have been yeah. some movies lately from Russia, like Leviathan mm -hmm. and also Loveless. Yes. And also a movie about a, a Russian band mm -hmm. and things like that that just show an awful life in Russia, just mm -hmm. a miserable mm -hmm. existence. Yeah. Uh, all the way. Is that... No. close to the way it is, um, or how are well, people responding I mean, to that? Yeah, I mean, by the way, Leviathan is a fabulous film. I, I highly recommend it if you haven't seen it. It's, it's very depressing, um, but it's great. Um, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, I, I think it's fair to say that life is very difficult for most Russians. Um, you have to understand, though, um, that Russia has different of populations, obviously, uh, and different um, interest groups. Putin um, has pretty much abandoned the so-called Zapatniki. These are the westernizers in Russia. These are young people who live in Petersburg and Moscow and who use the internet and are oriented to the West and like Rus Western culture, media, and so on and so forth. His appeal is to kind of the, the average Russian who um, is living in villages in Siberia or small towns in the um, southern Russia. Um, and yeah, life is tough for them, but it's much better now than it was in the 90s, right? So the comparison is always not how much better it could be, but how much better it, wa it is than it was you know, 15 years ago. Um, if you think the Russia portrayed in those movies is bad, you should see what Russia was like 15 years ago. It was absolutely awful. And if you go to Moscow now, 
um, which by the way, the, I, every time I've been to Moscow in the last few years, I'm absolutely astonished to how few tourists there are in Moscow, except Chinese. Um, Western tourism to Russia has almost collapsed. Um, but if you go to Moscow, it has completely taken on the character of a central European city. It works really well. Um, it's really been cleaned up. It, it looks really prosperous. Life is pretty good. Russia has adjusted to the sanctions relatively well. It hurts some people, especially those who are working in uh, industries that are, are services that are connected to the West. But for average Russians, life is much, much better than it was in the immediate aftermath of the Soviet Union. Having said that, um, I do, my research is based on large public opinion surveys, right? So I believe in the power of big numbers, usually, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of people answering these questions. And the single best question to use to understand how people think about almost everything is to ask the question, was the collapse of the Soviet Union a right step or a wrong step? If you said it was a right step, typically you're younger, you are uh, well-educated, you're, you know, involved, um, with Western culture and, and the Western world, and you're probably doing pretty well. So the collapse of the Soviet Union is a pretty good thing for you. But for the majority of people in Russia, and in fact, many other post-Soviet countries, especially Ukraine, most people think that the end of the Soviet Union was a wrong step, that the Soviet Union should have continued, that life was relatively good. It wasn't great, but at least it was stable. There was a, a steady supply of food and accommodation and holidays and all this sort of thing. And if you're somebody who has, um, who has struggled in the aftermath of the Soviet Union, especially in the Darwinian capitalism of the 1990s, then the Soviet times look, look pretty good. Professor Laughlin, yep. I have the unenviable position of standing between you and the questions here. Okay. But I, on behalf of all of the peace-loving people on the planet <laughs> and the Boulder Rotary Club, we want to thank you for your presentation and your words today. Okay. And on behalf of this club, we're donating 100 doses of polio vaccine in your honor in some small way to make this world a better place. Thank you very much thank for you. joining thank us you. today. Thank you.